Hey, welcome to this new video. Uh, I got tagged in a tweet earlier uh, by Stefan asking how it could be possible to potentially monitor uh, low intensity or zone two training with NEARS. Um, and he said he, he hadn't necessarily seen any information about that. So what I'm going to share here is really some more some personal um, empirical data, let's say stuff that I've seen uh, through my testing and through my training as well. Uh, I, I personally haven't seen it done for long periods of time. Uh, although I do think that if the calibration is done properly and, and testing has been performed on the, the athlete beforehand, uh, we, can, we can most likely use NEARS to quantify uh, low intensity training, just like we might do a lactate test and then base uh, our heart rate values on that first lactate threshold and then use heart rate instead of lactate directly during a session to monitor to monitor this. So I guess before giving the details on uh, what it would look like, I think it's one thing that I've noticed and uh, talking to my colleague, uh, Jem Arnold, who's doing research currently with NEARS technology, uh, a thing that we've noticed is that there's actually two if you let's look at the VL in cycling, uh, just to be just to make it easy, because then we can go into other sports and other um, sensor placements. But essentially, what we've seen is two different profiles, two different presentations of the nearest signal um, on a given athlete in uh, cycling and on the vastus lateralis. So the first profile, and right now we don't have any better names, so this, those are from Jem, so I'm borrowing those from him. Uh, the first profile is a parabolic profile, and essentially what you're gonna see is a upwards trend in SMO2 during the work uh, bouts, okay? So during the interval, once, uh, once you've passed the onset kinetics, that first 90 to 120 seconds, and once you have uh, quasi balance, let's say, uh, between delivery and utilization, you will see an upward trend in SMO2 in the moderate intensity domain. Uh, so that's on the parabolic profile. And then in the heavy intensity domain, you will likely see uh, a flat uh, a flat trend of the SMO2. And then uh, in the severe intensity domain, you'll see a uh, significantly decreasing trend in SMO2 for that parabolic uh, presentation or profile. Now, the other profile that seems to emerge in other in different athletes is a linear profile, and the linear profile it actually has a flat SMO2 uh, trend uh, in the moderate intensity domain. It has a decreasing trend uh, in the heavy intensity domain, and then you have uh, a flat at the SMO2 minimum in the severe intensity domain. So it's got a flat down flat whereas the parabolic profile has an up flat down in the three in those three uh, intensity domains. I hope I'm clear. It's a little hard without the graph in front of you, but I hope you can you can imagine that um, on a on a graph, okay? If we were going from uh, low intensity all the way up to to the higher intensities through some maybe some 20 watt 30, 25 or 30 watt steps, this is kind of the two main presentations we would see. We're still not sure why we see those differences. Same muscle, same modality of work. Uh, and this doesn't seem to be necessarily a correlation with the level of the athlete because Jim has seen that in, uh, he's seen both profiles, both presentations in uh, fairly well-trained athletes. And I've seen both in less well-trained athletes as well. Um, my hunch is that it's something to do with maybe the depth of the signal or the depth to which the signal uh, reaches inside the muscle. So it might have something to do with adipose tissue thickness um, and or potentially fiber type distribution uh, and maybe the, the different, um, if I may say, oxygen kinetics of uh, different, uh, different fibers. And depending on the athlete, that might induce or that might uh, translate into a different presentation of that SMO2 signal in different intensity domains. Uh, it might not be that. It might be something else. We're still not sure. We're still trying to figure out why you get those two different trends um, for a similar activity with a similar muscle group. If anybody has insights on that, we're all ears 
uh, obviously to, to keep the conversation moving forward. That being said, now that we know that, if you've tested your athlete beforehand and you know uh, what profile they're going to have, um, then you can actually play with, I guess, the zero slope is what we would be talking about here. If you have a linear profile, then the zero slope of SMO2, at least in the first instances of the, the first half of the test, is going to be close to your first threshold. Okay, it doesn't have to be right on your first threshold. There was that, that great paper uh, about the gray zone recently uh, talking about that that interval between, let's say, MLSS and critical power, and then looking at peripheral threshold detection as well. I think they were looking at uh, HHB or deoxyhemoglobin there and, and some and breakpoints. And there's obviously variation between different thresholds. We even know that a lactate threshold and a benzoate threshold are not necessarily exactly the same. Um, so there, there's a margin of error there. We need to take that into account. But uh, for me, I have a linear profile. And if I look at my zero slope uh, of SMO2, so the, the, the moment it starts pulling down rather than staying flat, it corresponds very closely, 10 watts, thereabouts, uh, more or less 10 watts from my lactate threshold one. Uh, it's maybe not the case for everybody, but uh, I've noticed that on myself. And uh, I'm still connect collecting more data on other athletes. Uh, so I don't have a huge sample so far, but it's usually within within 10 to, to 20 watts, plus minus 10 to 20 watts, which can be fairly significant, obviously. Um, but that's I think it's important to put that out there that we don't want to, I don't want to take, I don't want to say that a, an SMO2 threshold or, or breakpoint is the equivalent of a systemic uh, threshold because it's not necessarily the case. Um, so for me, if I were to look at my SMO2 and just ride and then keep that trend flat, um, that would work well to stay in my moderate density domain. Um, and then if you have a parabolic profile, you don't want to just look for the zero slope because that actually gets you closer to critical power. And that's actually something that Brett Kirby looked at in his paper, if I'm not mistaken, using the MOXIE and looking at uh, Delta SMO2 and uh, critical power and the relationship between between those two. So remember in the in the linear profile, the, the SMO2 is flat in the modern intensity domain, whereas in the parabolic profile, the SMO2 is flat in the heavy intensity domain. Uh, so again, that break point from flat to negative slope uh, can be either threshold depending on what profile you're looking at. So that's something that we need to consider. Uh, but again, beyond that, yeah, you could use uh, an increasing trend to stay in the modern density domain. I'm, I don't have a parabolic profile and I haven't worked um, consistently enough with someone who does to actually tell you what happens uh, if you if you stay in that moderate. The, the problem I see with a parabolic profile was, would, would be that if you do your, your warm up where you see a, a, a continuing increase of SMO2 um, in the modern density domain, that would, that would most likely be um, how do you know when you go from moderate to heavy? Um, because at some point you're going to reach an SMO2 max and it's going to have to plateau. So in that case, I'm not too sure. And I'd be happy to hear someone else, someone else's point of view on that, on how to, how to reconcile those two. Um, so the, the parabolic, I'm, I'm less sure, but for someone with a linear profile, I would say that you can definitely use that zero slope to uh, make the difference between a moderate and a, and, a, and a heavy effort, especially if you have those uh, SMO2 trends correlated or uh, uh, side by side with uh, ventilatory or lactate data that you can, so that you can then uh, determine how close or how far from systemic thresholds those uh, local or peripheral uh, thresholds or breakpoints uh, happen. And then f based on that, you, you could theoretically, like I said, I, I've, I've, I've collected many, many uh, data on myself on that, but I haven't applied it consistently with athletes simply because I don't have currently any athletes that have a MOXIE or that even want to use a MOXIE to, to do so. Um, but yeah, you could then look at that trend and say, well, I know what my SMO2 max is for today. Uh, given that I'm in the modern intensity domain and uh, I want to maintain that for as long as possible. And I don't want to let it decrease. 
Uh, I also did, and I'm going to do a video on that in a couple of days, uh, actually tomorrow with Andrew Feldman, who co-developed the, the Moxie uh, and who works extensively with the device uh, and has published in the, uh, with the device as well, or using the, the, the technology as well. Uh, we're doing a review of some data I collected where I did efforts in the moderate, heavy, and severe domains in normoxia, nor, normoxia and then hypoxia. And so you will actually see that that slope changes, that slope changes depending on what, uh, on what domain I, I find myself in and obviously in what uh, conditions I, I find myself in. So could we say that maybe those, th that information could even be used uh, in, at altitude? So when somebody goes to altitude, instead of having to do another lactate test or, or else to determine how the thresholds have uh, moved, well, if you know your slope, if you know your SMO2 profile, if you know your slopes and you can track that in real time, then you could theoretically um, have a good idea of where your thresholds are uh, without necessarily needing a retest when the environment changes, whether it's uh, the heat, altitude, uh, and then combine that to fatigue as well and, and all these other envir environmental factors, internal and external, that can have an influence on the internal load. So that's how I think it can, can and could be and probably has been used as well. I've heard of other people using it as well. Uh, again, I've only used it on myself in that regard, so I don't have a ton of data to talk about, uh, but I thought I would just share my thoughts and, and, and again, be conscious of those two different profiles and presentations uh, because it, it, it does matter. It does matter. Uh, and uh, you don't want to mistake a zero slope of, of a linear profile for the zero slope of a parabolic profile because, again, uh, you could be pretty far uh, from from the mark with those. Uh, I hope that was helpful. I hope that was clear enough despite the lack of visuals. Uh, so feel free to leave me a comment. If you have any follow-ups, uh, I'll gladly uh, I'll gladly expand on that. And I'm doing a video with Jem on Wednesday as well. So there'll be more uh, info on my YouTube channel about all that pretty soon. Thanks for uh, tuning in. And again, uh, leave me a like if you enjoyed the video. Make sure you subscribe if, if it's not done yet. It's free and you can always change your mind. And I'll see you in the next thought of the day. Take care.